So what is it really interesting? It is love in the age of porn. Interesting? Yeah, okay, okay. Let me begin by first asking you a few questions. Right? Have you ever been in love? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Right, 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 right. Have you ever heard of or watched porn? Yes. <laughs> Do you think they go hand in hand? Um, okay. <laughs> Do you think they may interfere with each other? Yes, no? Okay, let us see. Let's see what we are talking about. So, we are talking about love, which is affection sexual attraction, a romantic relationship. And a relationship is how two people interact with each other, behave and deal with each other. Whereas porn is an explicit display of sexual organs or sexual activity aimed at stimulating excitement. It's not about love or relationships. Most people begin to start watching porn out of curiosity. Right? So, is is curiosity normal? Yeah. And if it is normal, should we have formal sexuality education? Or shall we... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So you don't want to leave it to life or nature. They will learn as they go by. Right? Okay, let's see what happens in nature. In nature, Alan Dixon and various other researchers have found that the infant is taught sexual mounting behavior by the mother. I'm not saying that should happen in the human beings, but <laughs> this, is, this is what is happening in nature. Right? And as the child grows bigger, it indulges in what is called socio-sexual play with its peers. And if either of these or both are interfered with, it interferes with its adult social as well as sexual behavior. It's a very important aspect of normal social and sexual development of, uh, the, of the animal. What about human beings? Similar behavior has been seen. Children as uh, begin to explore themselves, genital exploration is normal from the first year of life. Children as young as six months old can experience orgasm, obviously without sexual imagery or thoughts. As they grow older, they indulge in what is called romantic sexual play. They play doctor, doctor, they play, you know, marry, home, home, and all that. And they also spy on adults and adolescents and young adults, and they imitate sexual behavior. Freud believed that early childhood, and not puberty, was the first critical period when brain maps about sexuality, relationship, and love were laid in our minds. As a child grows older and enters puberty, say this is the data from 5 to 13-year-olds uh, from uh, Kinsey, and it, says, it shows that psychosocial and sexual play increases, more so in boys than in girls for whatever reasons, um, and they indulge in this kind of play with their peers. What would happen if this sexual curiosity was not satisfied, if they were not allowed to explore themselves or do any of these things? Then it is known that penetrative sex is not instinctive. And Dr. Shoeba and myself, we have had patients who come with infertility for one year, two years, no babies. Have you been having penetrative sex? What? They have been having what is called <laughs> coitus bifemoris, that is, Latin for sex between the thighs, right? So penetrative sex is not instinctive. It has to be taught. It has to be seen or heard of. And we knew this since time immemorial. 25,000-year-old figurines, oil lamps from Rome depicting the coitus uh, from the back, figurines from uh, Pompeii excavations, our own Kama Sutra, our own temples, where you find explicit sexual imagery of all kinds <coughs> high up on the temple walls, where older children, young people can see them, not small toddlers. And then with the onset of printing press, we had the first book, which was banned because it was pornographic. It was popularly known as Fanny Hill. 
right? So these were all still images. What is the effect when the sexual imagery that I am watching is alive? It's real life, blood, flesh, people, real people doing it through a medium that can edit the images, that can expand it, that can do whatever it wants with it. Over to Dr. Shoeba for that. Can you hear me? Yeah. So the issue over here is when we're talking of pornography, I was sitting in this clinic, as Sangeeta was saying, and this gentleman came in, about 28-year-old man, and he sat down and said, I have a problem. Yes. I've been married six months, and my wife can't satisfy me. Right? You know, I have erections only for six minutes. Um, actually, two to five minutes is a good time. No. OK. Um, how long do you think an erection should last? 40 to 45 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if you have an erection which is lasting for 45 minutes, either you're going to get a heart attack and die, <laughs> or your penis is going to fall off. <laughs> he didn't believe me. I said, um, have you been watching porn? So that's my concern. I spoke to a urologist friend of mine after this and I said, are you having also these questions coming up? And he said, don't ask. <laughs> In the last six months, when Viagra first came out, Sildenafil, he said, I got six cases of guys who came in with erections which didn't go down after six hours. They couldn't pee. They were crying. <laughs> They'd also gone and had hematomas in the penis because they were trying to do stuff which is not biologically possible. And they had to be hospitalized. Because they all thought that what they saw in porn was reality. And so that's my problem with porn. It's like Mission Impossible. <laughs> Die hard. <laughs> in the bedroom. So doesn't work. So my concern is over here that how do we make this work? My concerns with porn, and porn is here to stay, right? And if you look at kids and all, if you tell them, don't watch porn, they go, what was porn? <laughs> Doesn't work. So my concern is when people are watching porn, you're watching something that's not real. It's very exciting. It's full of curiosity. I really want to know this. Remember when you first saw it, you saw some naked pictures, and you went, oh my god. <laughs> then that became passe, and you went, oh, real sex. Man, this is real sex. And then he went a little further and said, oh, this is boring. Like, let's see something more and more. And after some time, you get desensitized. And pornography makers will keep giving you even more and more and more images to try and satisfy the desensitization. And after some time, that's your reality. And what you're doing in that, it's pure self-gratification. It's you and a screen. And normal sex is not a screen. It's two human beings talking with each other. They need to speak to another. They have to have emotional content. There's nothing like that. So after some time, you start getting isolated. Can you imagine? I don't need to go to college anymore. I can do online studies. I don't need to go to work to an office. I can work from home. I don't even go, need to go to the market. I can get vegetables. I can get home furnishings. I can get everything, all of it, online. And now? Sex online too, so I have no ability to communicate with anybody. I get isolated. I'm stuck in that small space, and I don't get a companion. I don't know how to communicate. Love, intimacy, not there. And this causes psychological dependence over a period of time. Loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, depression, sense of isolation. All of it starts coming in and coming in and affecting me. Right. So in this scenario, how can we develop a healthy attitude towards sex and sexuality? We have to keep in mind certain evolutionary aspects, evolutionary factors that have shaped our bodies and our behavior. Let's take a look. Right. So we are the one and only of monkey and ape species. There are 193 of them, and we are the only one that stood up walks on two feet, lost its fur, and in the process became naked. 
naked in the sense that our sexual organs and sexual signals which are inherent in our bodies, because we are sexual beings, so we have inherent sexual messages in our bodies, they became very obvious. Equally curious is the fact that we cover up across all cultures, even in societies that wear minimal clothing. Somehow, genitals seem to be covered up. Why? We don't know exactly. But Dan Fessler of the University of California, he believes that social nudity would be a threat to the mating pair. We mate and we form a relationship for an extended period of time because our children take so, so long to grow up, 14 years before they can reproduce. And we share our parenting duties. So men and women live together. Also, we live in a city of 7 million people, right? And our life is not about just survival, reproduction, sex. That, that's something that plants and animals also do. We would like to create, we would like to invent, we would like to get a sense of fulfillment through that. In that context, covering up our sexual signals might help. So when we cover up, it's important to understand what it does to our sexual signaling. In the male body, when I put clothes, I increase the width of the shoulders and the height. These are the sexual signals inherent in the male body. In the female, it is a shape. And the shape, it's not the size, it's the shape. The shape can be completely obliterated or completely enhanced by clothing. So through clothing, a woman can alter her sexual signaling, but a man can't. It's only enhancement on the man's side, but on the female side, it's both, either. So just like I communicate through my body language, I also use clothes to communicate, give a sense of my individuality, my identity, my sexuality. So when I'm clothing, when I'm choosing a dress, what is it that I want to draw attention to? And remember, we dress up to go out. It's not just me, myself, I like it, I'll wear it. No, you're dressing up and you're going out. So what do I want to emphasize? Is my height, as a size of my organs, the most important trait that I have? Is that what I want to use as a basis, something that I got by genetic lottery? I have nothing to do with it. Or do I want to bring into focus my qualities, my attitudes, my beliefs, my behavior? Something that I've put an effort into. What do I want to look for in a friend, in a mate? Think about it. Another thing to keep in mind is that all across cultures, we do sex in private. And it is believed that it is part of uh, self-preservation, avoiding danger, because rapid self-defense is not possible during the sexual act or during excretion. So we perform these functions in private. Other factors could be hiding from the alpha male, they could be fear, they could be jealousy, competition, what have you, power play. But the truth is that all across cultures, we do it in private. And in fact, this behavior is so universal that Darwin felt that the sense of shame arose to prevent us from performing our sexual and excretory functions in public and thereby protecting ourselves. Now here it is important that shame is a sense, is a feeling of regret or guilt when you know that you have done something wrong. It's in the doing. It's not a body part. No child is born feeling ashamed of its body or genitals or whatever. No. Shame arises when I purposely, deliberately abuse or break the norms that I have myself accepted. Right? So shame is in a behavior and we need to put it there. We need to take it away from parts of the body, from you know, shaming people by, by pulling off their clothes. No, the person who is pulling off the clothes is doing the shameful act not the person who has been uh, disrobed. No, certainly not. In fact, exhibitionism and Marty Maclia, these are, uh, Marty Maclia is deriving pleasure from doing sex in public. Both of these are considered mental disorders, and they're also illegal. Yeah. That's over to Dr. Schäuber. So, how do we ensure that we have a healthy sexuality? Because 
sexuality is a part of you, it's a major part of you and to be able to enjoy that part, to be able to be enriched with that is essential. Now, children often, especially when we're younger, we often don't listen to what our adults tell us, but we often do what we watch them do. Now, learning about sexuality, unfortunately, should be from parents and teachers, which does not mean that children get ringside seats in the parents' bedroom. Let's get that clear. What children do need is to understand that there is something which is healthy sexuality. So as parents start with small children, the most important thing is naming the body parts. You say eyes, nose, belly button. You say penis, vagina, toes, knees. You use the words because they are part of the body and no part of the body has shame. Each part of the body has an important function which has to be taken care of and looked after. The other thing is, surprisingly, sexuality depends on your self-worth. And how did your self-worth start? Your self-worth starts because you like the body you have. What you see in porn is a lie. You know that guy with a, you know what, one foot long? I'm sorry, that's computer generated. And there's probably one guy in 200 million who has that and that's why he's paid to act in that. And all of you go, oh my God, I don't have one that size. And they have women with huge breasts and you think that that's what it's meant to be, otherwise you're not. I'm sorry, that's not true. Your body with its shape and size is unique and perfect. And once you get aware of your body and understand it, that's when you can enjoy your body perfectly. And sex is always a transaction between two people. And there has to be respect in that because only when you give respect do you have self-respect. So if somebody else, if your partner says no to sex, it means no. It doesn't mean keep on asking till the person does it. When a person says, I'll kiss, but I don't want anything further, that's it. It's your self-respect which says, don't ask again. It means when your relationship is not working and is breaking up, you don't have to get nasty and vicious towards the other person. It's like it broke up because we weren't meant for each other. Separate, move apart, find another person. There's a beautiful space where they say that never run after a boy or a girl because they are like the buses. There's always another one around the next corner. So please enjoy yourselves. Thank you so much.